why do you believe specialized training is necessary to run NGOs? I think, um, see, when we started, Sabrina and I, when we started, we had no background whatsoever uh, in the NGO world. Mm. I'm, a, I'm a, a technician. I did four different technical studies. Uh, Sabrina is a university dropout. Mm. And so we never set up an organization. And so Sabrina and I, we started very spontaneously. And luckily, we, it was the two of us. And we were stubborn enough to get through all the challenges that we had. Mm. And in the end, we, we managed. But a lot of people, they start very spontaneously, but they're alone. Mm. And if you have a wonderful idea and you're driven, that is, that is of course, the first thing that is, that is what counts, right? Running a company or running an NGO, it needs an organization in general, right? It needs to be organized properly. And so to, to let someone who is very enthusiastically on one side to, to address a social problem, mm -hmm. to give them some structure, on, right? On fundraising, um, a lot of people, they try to, they start off very well, but then suddenly there's no money. And then they have to give up, right? And it's the beneficiaries that then, you know, suffer. Right. And that's something that we want to prevent. So we want to make sure that they are organized, they plan, they work on fundraising, they work on reporting, they have a good website so that they get the funds needed to run in a sustainable manner. Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a vodcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. If you are new to our channel, please consider subscribing to it and hit the bell icon so that you never miss an update. I am your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm privileged to welcome a very, very accomplished individual who's doing so much for the society, Paul Cronenberg. Paul, welcome to the show. Good morning. Uh, Paul is the co-founder and director of Kanthari. He's a social change and change engineer. Um, he has received knighthood in the Order of the Orange Nassau from the Queen of Holland. And he has been much awarded and recognized along with his partner, Sabrie. So, uh, Paul, tell me, what made you select India as home? Well, we have a, our journey started a long time ago in 1997, mm -hmm. starting, and I ended up in Tibet by pure coincidence. That's where I met Sabria. And Sabria is blind. She developed the Tibetan Braille script. Mm -hmm. And um, one thing led to the next one. Later, we went back to Tibet, started the first school for the blind. We started a vocational training farm for the blind. We had a Braille printing press, a self integration program. And after many years in Tibet that we worked on this, we uh, understood that we at some point have to leave Tibet as foreigners. And um, so then we looked for leadership training centers for our blind students so they could take over and run Braille Without Borders. That's the, that's the organization yep. that we started first. And then we started to look for international, you know, institutes and, and training centers, but we couldn't find anything that was hands-on practical. And then we said, why not? We're going to start our own. We have a little bit of experience of how not to do things. We, did a lot, we made a lot of mistakes. And then suddenly we're thinking of um, putting up a place that is very central. And you've got a beautiful world map behind you. Mm -hmm. And if you see that Trivandrum is in the, in the south of India, yeah. if you draw a circle around it, and you enlarge it, you have on one side, you have a you have Australia, Asia, Europe, and Africa, mm. and you're in the center of that. Mm. That's where 6.5 billion people live. So we said, why not going there <laughs> in the center of the world and start, you know, this, this uh, training center, which is now called Kantari. <laughs> how, how nice. So let's talk of Kantari. You know, just before we started talking, uh, you said you're telling me Kantari is actually a small uh, chili. Uh, but tell me about this venture and about the name. So when we started this, in, we came here in 2005 first time and we started off as International Institute for Social Entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And it's a terrible name, IASE, International Institute for Social Entrepreneurs. And luckily one day, Sabria and I were at lunch and we're sitting on the balcony. I can see it from here. And mm -hmm. uh, so suddenly Sabria jumped up and she was like, what is this? What is this? Yeah. And one of our colleagues said, oh, that's you probably bid on a Kantari. And then we understood that this Kantari is a very small but extremely yeah. spicy chili. Uh -huh. And we hit the jackpot because we thought that's a perfect name for a change maker. And hopefully in a few years from now, uh, people don't speak about Mandela or Gandhi as just Mandela and Gandhi, but as Kantari Mandela or Kantari Gandhi. So as the change maker that it is. And uh, so that's how we came up uh, with the name Kantari as such. 
-hmm. It grows wild in the backyard. Mm -hmm. It has very good, um, uh, I say it has very uh, good medicinal values. So it's good for you. Mm -hmm. And this is what we need. We need change makers mm -hmm. that heal the society, mm -hmm. right? That's what we are looking for. Very well said. So, you know, when I was reading about you, you speak about your journey in five acts as, as a curriculum. Mm -hmm. uh, take me through this and help me understand. So what we do is we, we train people that have overcome adversity. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they carry a plan to make a difference within their communities. Mm -hmm. So if somebody has been affected by blindness and they start a project for blind people, that's much more convincing than a sighted person is going to do something for blind people. Mm -hmm. Or the same way for people that are being killed because they have al albinism in East Africa. If a person with urbanism is starting, you know, to start up a project and say, we cannot be killed, right. that's much more convincing. So we, that's the kind of people that we train. And we take them through a curriculum that helps them start and set up and run an organization in a sustainable way. Mm -hmm. So every organization, and it doesn't matter if you run uh, an act, you know, if you're an activist or if you are a environmentalist or if you uh, run campaigns or any organization needs to be organized. Mm -hmm. So you have to have your policies in place. You have to have your good you know, agreements. Your paperwork has to be there, official registration, your accounting system, communication. Um, you have to have your, your reporting, your proposal writing, um, you know, basically a website, a brand, and a name, you know, a logo. There's, everything is the same for any organization or company in that matter. And this is what we do in a five, you know, a journey in five acts curriculum. And what we do is we, we, we split it up in parts that are all hands-on learning. Mm -hmm. It's all learning by doing because that's the best way of learning. But failing is one of the best things that can happen to you because if you fail plenty of times enough, at some point, you know, it makes a click that you say like, okay, this didn't work. So now how can we make it work? Okay. So the first thing is basically we take people to a uh, fictitious country. Uh, it's called Tanzania. And we let them set up and run an organization within that country. And they come across all real life scenarios um, that will help them to remember how easy it is to make mistakes and how also uh, what can be done to come up with the right solutions or to prevent mistakes. And that's, of course, the better thing to prevent it. And the second act is um, it's, it's split up in two parts. In the second act, they first put an event profile for their own organization. So they um, they write up bits and pieces of what the organization is all about, their personal history, uh, what they, the problem is they want to address and how they are going to address it. And these are building blocks they can use for websites, for uh, brochures, for you know any any communication that they they need um the second part of that they organize themselves the participants organize a trip to visit kantari graduates in south of india and other ngos to mm -hmm. learn best practice so okay. they're gonna meet graduates and they see what problems they were facing and of course they learn from their mistakes you know and prevent that when they go back um, the third act is that's the first time they go live with their project so they also they organize a street event in random they have to do the entire organization and it's where they present for the first time in public their idea of the change they want to create within their own communities right. the fourth act that's the last right. act at our campus here because the, the, the course is split up in two parts it's seven months at the Kantari campus here in Kerala mm -hmm. And then it's five months at home. And this fourth act is basically about public speech. They're going to do a, a public presentation about their um, venture. And that's we call it Kantari Talks. And Kantari Talks are very interesting. They're like TEDx Talks. Mm -hmm. However, with TEDx Talks, speak very well. You never know if you really have the, um, the subject matter expertise because nobody can ask them questions. Mm -hmm. They do their talk, they get applause, and they're gone. So what we did, we combined it with a panel of experts. So first they do a 10-minute presentation, and then they get 10 minutes Q&A, and they're being fried. <laughs> right. So they really have to show that right. they have the subject matter expertise to not just talk about something, but also that they have the knowledge of actually going and do something. Mm -hmm. After that, they leave for home, mm -hmm. and then there's a five-month startup phase where they are supported by mentorship through mm -hmm. Kantari graduates. So they are from the same region. They mm -hmm. went through the same challenges of setting up, registering, registering, et cetera. So they helped them. And within one year, most of them, they managed to get registered and to get going. And from the last 11 years since we've done this, we trained 226 participants, wow. 48 countries, and they run more than 130 organizations now that on, on a daily basis, they reach several thousand people that are on the margins of society. Mm -hmm. Amazing, amazing. So tell me, you know, uh, why do you believe specialized training is necessary to run NGOs? 
I think, um, see, when we started, Sabrina, when we started, we had no background whatsoever uh, in the NGO world. Mm. I'm, a, I'm a, a technician. I did four different technical studies. Uh, Sabrina is a university dropout. Mm -hmm. And so we never set up an organization. And so Sabrina and I, we started very spontaneously. And luckily, we, it was the two of us. And we were stubborn enough to get through all the challenges that we had. Mm -hmm. And in the end, we, we managed. But a lot of people, they start very spontaneously, but they're alone. Mm -hmm. And if you have a wonderful idea and you're driven, that is, that is of course, the first thing that is, that is what counts, right? Running a company or running an NGO, it needs an organization in general, right? It needs to be organized properly. And so to, to let someone who is very enthusiastically on one side to, to address a social problem, mm -hmm. to give them some structure, on, right? On fundraising, um, a lot of people, they try to, they start off very well, but then suddenly there's no money mm -hmm. and then they have to give up, right? And it's the beneficiaries that then, you know, suffer. Right. And that's something that we want to prevent. So we want to make sure that they are organized, they plan, they work on fundraising, they work on reporting, they have a good website so that they get the funds need needed to run in a sustainable manner. Very interesting. And, you know, again, when I was reading about you, you, there's a comment made that you like to address questions like why and why not. Uh, can you help me understand with some examples? Well, I think uh, let's look at this. Let us, let's look at the state of the world. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example of a person that's right now working on a homeless person that is about to die. Mm -hmm. um, so I have, I have two, two examples. One is the first one is if we look at our world, uh, you turn on the news at night, the news reader starts with good evening. Mm -hmm. And then 10 minutes after that, you, st you scratch your head and you go, what's good, good evening? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. So um, it's all, it's terrible what's happening. So, and the second thing is, what are we as humankind Hmm. What, what mess did we put ourselves into? So the example that I have is that two people in a park and they have a big discussion about alien life. Mm -hmm. One person mm -hmm. says to the other one, I'm 100% sure that there's very advanced alien life up in space. Mm -hmm. And the other guy says, how, how can you be 100% sure we've never met them? And he says, well, exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they came with their spaceship. They parked it in front of our beautiful planet and they looked mm -hmm. and they said, beautiful planet, but what are these creatures? And he says, oh, uh, this one alien, he said to the other one, I said, those are people. He said, what do these people do? He said, well, they confuse me because they walk into shops and they buy packages that says smoking kills. Mm -hmm. So he says, are they suicidal? He said, I don't know, but millions of people seem to be. <laughs> then he zoomed in further and he saw that there was countries. And yesterday I read an article that uh, $9 trillion was spent last year, last year during a crisis, a pandemic on weapons. Mm -hmm. And so, and then he said, so how does that work with the weapons? He said, well, this country here, and he was pointing at America, he said last year they spent $82 trillion on, uh, a billion dollars on weapons. And um, he said, so which aliens are they defending themselves against? He says, not aliens, <laughs> other people. So again, they were gobsmacked. And then they zoomed in further and they saw poor people at the equator level. This is the most stupid thing. They saw them at the equator level, digging in the earth to get bits and pieces of gold. Mm -hmm. They would sell it to people with more money and the gold bars would go bigger and bigger. And the big gold bars go to very rich people. And what do they do with it? They put it back in the ground in the safe. Right. And that's what we're doing. And so we're not really helping each other to solve issues that need to be solved. And now I come to the second point, and this is um, about Anumutu. Anumutu is from um, Pondicherry, and when he was five years old, he lost his father, and he became a, a, a child laborer. Mm -hmm. And luckily, when he was 11, he was safe from that. He was put into a school, became a designer and photographer. And he lost his heart to the homeless people in Pondicherry. And when he came to our project, we said, well, but you've never been homeless. So you're not part of your target group and that's not, you know, it's a little bit of a top down approach. And then he said, I'm going to try this. So he went on the street three years ago, four years ago in 2017, when Ochi, this was the big cyclone that hits uh, Trivandrum. For three days, he was on the street on the railway station and he came back a broken man. And I asked him what happened. He said, I've never been so hungry, thirsty and, and, and cold. He said, but that was not the issue. He said, the problem was I became invisible. Wow. On average, there are 3,000 people walking through that railway station every hour, every day. For three days, thousands of people walked past him and they didn't look at him. They looked away and that's a choice. Looking away is a choice. And I always say you're responsible for what you choose to do and you're responsible for what you choose not to do. And that's second part. That's where the problem lies because people, they choose to look away. 
And this is something that we have to do right now with the COVID pandemic, with, you know, in our daily neighbor, you know, in our daily life every day, we have a choice to either step up and do something or to look away, but it's a choice. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we need more people to step up and not look away from things. And that's why the question, why? <laughs> why are people looking away? Because it's, it's, it's the easiest way out. Mm -hmm. It's not my problem, right? It's, people say, oh, it's only one straw, but it's said by 8 billion people. And that is a problem, right? So we are, we come here with responsibility and we have to pick up that responsibility. And I hope that somehow if everybody would ask their neighbor in the morning, how are you? Mm. Our world would be different. Yeah. Well said. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> so my next question to you, Paul, is that what in your opinion are some of the major social issues humanity faces? Mm. And one, of course, you said very, very correctly is looking away. I mean, most of us just look away. Mm. But what are you know, I, I just wanted to understand your perspective. I think um, in, in general, I think, um, see, I, my, my, I have a very simple life, uh, I would say, slogan. Life is what you're happy getting up for. Mm -hmm. And so I have to go back a little bit to the story that we started with uh, in Tibet because we work with blind people. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, I think this is uh, probably the answer uh, to your question. Um, a lot of people get up in the morning and they're not very happy. Mm. I, I think most people, <laughs> to me, at least a lot of people that I know. I know a lot of people are very happy, but a lot of people are not. And why are they not happy? Because they're doing something they're not happy doing. Mm. And so when we started Brave Without Borders in Tibet, we worked with blind children. Mostly blind children, they were locked away in a dark room and they were left to die. So when they first came to us, we had a big challenge. Mm. And luckily, so that one boy and here is what it comes down to it's all about dignity so this boy was his name was uh, Tenzin and when he met somebody he said oh you're blind I'm blind too and somebody asked him so what do you do well I'm the yak herder in the village but I would like to go to school but when he was the yak herder he had a task mm -hmm. if you have a task you have value if you have value normally you're respected and if you are respected then you have dignity right. dignity comes in when there right. is some respect right. and only then when dignity is in place, self-confidence can come. Mm. So now if I look around in the world and the people that I meet, a lot of people, they never meant it, made it to the part of dignity. Mm. So their self-confidence is a fake one. Mm. And they have to overcompensate with an expensive car, with, you know, uh, expensive watches, gadgets, you know, like a trophy wife, trophy husband, <laughs> big house, whatever it is. But it's inside, it's an empty shell. So now to do what it is that you want to do, and this is what solution was for the students that we got in, mm. we started a dream factory. With these little kids, when we came back to Tibet in 1998, we started a dream factory. We said, what is it that you want to do? If I have to, becomes I want to. That's, mm -hmm. become, that's where the magic begins. If I have to, becomes I want to. That's where the magic begins. So we asked these kids, what do you dream of doing? And there's an eight-year-old Nobu who smiles. And he says, I want to become a taxi driver. Yeah. <laughs> so, of course, he's blind and he probably never makes it as a taxi driver. But we said, wonderful. I have no right to destroy anyone's dream. Nobody has that. Sure. If only we would be dream, believe in everybody's dreams, our world would be different today. So two years afterwards, we let him dream. So he spoke English, Tibetan, Chinese, walks with his cane, serves on the internet. We asked him, what about the dream of being a taxi driver? He said, well, now I realize because I can't see, maybe it's not so safe to become a taxi driver, but I can set up a taxi company and run it. Mm -hmm. And he was 10 years old. Then two years after that, he went to Holland. He was the first blind person ever to fly from Tibet to Holland. Learned to make cheese, came back, started a cheese factory. Now, this is like 20 years ago when that happened. Now he runs a restaurant and a medical massage clinic. He's successful. Why? Because he does something that he loves doing. So for anyone out there, if you think about what, if you're not happy getting up in the morning, you should really think about, are you doing the right thing? Mm. Right. And if you're just that automatically, when you're doing the right thing, you definitely are better off yourself, but it's also better off for the people around you. And in that way, we can also make a difference in this world. Very interesting. So, you know, one more question uh, relating to the, the social sector space, and then we'll move to mm. for you. You know, you work with so many NGO leaders, mm -hmm. you train so many people to, so that they can run the good uh, NGOs. What, in your opinion, are some of the key uh, features or key factors uh, an NGO leader should have? I think any leader should have. I think it's uh, the first, of course, is, is integrity and and ethics. 
right? It's uh, if you start with those two, ethics is something that you understand to do the, that, that the right thing is the right thing because you understand, you understand, and it's not being told to you. Hmm. That's the difference between morals and ethics, right? Is the morals of being told you have to do this. It should not be about have to. It should be like, I, I understand that this is the right thing to do. And of course, you have to question that. Um, I think it's um, being a, or, or in leadership, um, I think it's, if, as, as a leader, you should try to create a better tomorrow every day, <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? And so to, to use whatever talent you have mm-hmm. um, to, to, to turn that into actions that create the impact that, and not just an impact for you, it should be the impact mm-hmm. for, for the larger society. And I think right now what is lacking in the world are leaders that are thinking 20, 30, 40 years ahead. Mm-hmm. True visionaries that see, okay, where are we heading all together? Not for the next legislature, uh, you know, period for my re-election, oh. but for you know, 30, 40 years. What is good for all of us? I think the the, the common good, like earlier mentioned, it is it is a, it's, it's a really weird concept that we split up our world in all these little countries, oh. and everybody's fighting for themselves right now. And oh. what I see, what I'm very sad about is that today, every day in this whole. COVID crisis, people are going to factories where they are still producing weapons. Um, we don't need weapons right now. We need yeah. one major well, weapon, and that's vaccines. So why not swapping all this and first focus on vaccines? And the other thing is that the Western world, we need to work together with everybody else and show solidarity. Because if we just, you know, the countries in the West solve it first by country, that's not the solution. The virus has no, uh, there's no no borders, right? It, it just travels. And we, we, we are all in this together. And I think this, this, this one, and it doesn't matter what, you know, background or race or culture, or, you know, we're all in this together. And I think leaders should understand that that's what it's about, right? The, the complete your story, not just me or my country or my street or my family, mm. it's all of us. Well said, well said. So and I'm going to move to the last segment of our conversation, uh, Paul, which is some questions for you personally. My first question to you is that for an individual who has built such an amazing organization like Antari, helping so many people around the country, what are some of the core values you believe in? Yeah, I, I mentioned it earlier. Yeah, I think it's integrity and keeping your word. Yes. Um, I, I never promise. That's one thing I don't do. I tell people I never promise because... I would feel terrible if I can't keep my promise. And you never know something comes in between. You can get ill, you can have an accident. And this relates back when I was in, in Tibet. Some people came in and they they promised our blind students they were being selected for the Paralympics in Beijing. Yeah. And our kids were wonderfully happy. They had big smiles on their faces. And they said, oh, in 14 days, they're going to be picked up, they're going to be trained. And they never came back. Pr- to promise something, it's a very difficult thing to do. But of course, you 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 keep your word, yeah. right? Um, I think it's it's very important to um, to honor whatever you stand for, and um, and of course, you have to stand for the. Um, if you make mistakes, you also have to stand up for that, and you have to. You know, we all make mistakes. We're all people, um, but then you can apologize and you can look at and see. Okay, what can we do different next time to avoid uh, coming in the same situation? But uh, I think in general, I think it's 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 creating. Uh, like in our campus as well, the Kantari campus, we created in a very environmental friendly way so that we are in harmony with, you know, the, the surrounding. We have a beautiful lake. I'm looking at a beautiful lake on my left here. Yeah. Uh, it's a beautiful yeah. campus. And I think that's also a very important part of, of creating workspaces and atmospheres where everybody feels very well mm-hmm. welcoming and because then they want to give their best to the organization. And I think that's, that's in the, to create something like that. I think it's an important part as well. Fascinating. My next question to you is that for someone who's you know, given so much of your life to India, who's given so much of giving back, from where you stand today, what does success mean to Paul? Well, first of all, I'm not giving back because I'm gaining. <laughs> that's, uh, I think that's, uh, see, the thing is, um, th- this is what, what a lot of people say, right? We, we, we got a lot of recognition and, and, and awards, and I think it's not very fair. We were knighted by the Dutch Queen. Mm. Um, for something that we love doing. Hmm. My sister worked for many years. She worked with uh, mentally um, uh, disabled people Mm -hmm. and she was beaten up. 
she was beaten up by those people and she still every day she went back and gave love to those people she wasn't knighted so i think it's the the the, the, the you know the award and recognition part i think is is not not just that i i i'm sacrificing myself here because i love what i do mm. and that's that's we are here seven days a week we work every day for the last 22 years now uh, we've been working and um so success for me i think is um if i look at success for us as an uh, personally i'm happy to see when when participants come in here we don't call them students we call them participants because it's participation with catalysts on an eye level it's not a teacher student <laughs> but it's on eye level and for me the biggest success is or a measurement of success is when participants come in here they gain you know skills and knowledge which really help them to to make that 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 leapfrog mm -hmm. step going back starting an organization and impacting the lives of their beneficiaries, of people that are on the margins of society, because that's what it's all about. For me, I don't see this beneficiary or, or the participant as a beneficiary as such. I see that person as a representative that is going to change the lives of the people in their communities. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's the nicest thing for us to see now that there's 130 plus um, graduates of Kantari that are changing the lives of thousands of people every single day. And that's something hopefully we can you know increase that number of people every year in the years to come. Paul, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure speaking to you. You know, I've really enjoyed listening to the incredible journey you've had with Kantari. You know, I, it has been an absolutely, my, my privilege to have spoken to you and learned so many new things. Thank you and oh, good thank luck. You. Thank you so much. <laughs>